Good morning, and welcome to the First United Methodist Church of Maumelle. Welcome to those that are here today in the flesh, and welcome to those that are worshiping with us online. We are one through the presence of the Holy Spirit that binds us all together wherever we are this morning. I am thankful to get to worship with you. This is an exciting day, and it's an exciting week. There's great things that are kicking off today. Uh, tonight, uh, starting at uh, 5 o'clock, we have a new Bible study. And this is a Bible study that is online, but it is one you, you need to register for. So what we're going to do tonight, just to make sure nobody missed that, we're going to kind of do a dry run where that we'll give you a few minutes uh, to send in your interest uh, while we are online on Facebook, and then we will switch uh, to strictly uh, another platform and get the get the Bible study started. I don't want anybody to miss the opportunity, and so that's how we're going to do it tonight. And those that have already signed up, you'll be getting that instruction this afternoon. Also, uh, we have our 7.30 service tonight is now our 6.30 service. The Holy Spirit has been mightily present at that service, and so have been a lot of mosquitoes, right? So we had to move a little earlier so that we would not be out there in the dark when the mosquitoes are at their worst. Uh, don't want to discourage you from coming. It's been a lot of fun. It's been a great service, and we've had a wonderful time with it. But 6.30 is that service tonight. And then Wednesday, we are starting another Bible study. And that one, there are some virtual participants, but it's largely on, uh, it is largely in person here on the campus at the same time that we have a children's ministry opportunity. And so that's uh, Wednesday night at 6.30, and if you would like to sign up for that, it's not too late. We just need to know of your interest. So this is a great day to worship God. We're thankful to get to be in his presence. Wherever we are, he is with us. Uh, we're thankful get to get to raise our voices and sing, and I hope you will do so uh, as our uh, band leads us this morning. We're so happy to be here to lead this morning. If you would, just feel free to stand and sing. How great this love, oh, it's moving all my mountains. This perfect love is casting out my fears. How great this love, oh, it welcomes me like family. Anywhere I go. He's good, and He is God. What I earn, it's not what I've got. He is just, yet oh so kind. What I deserve, it's not what I've got. What more could I say about him? My God is love. How great this love. And it's faithful through my failures. His trust and love is with me till the end. How great this love. Oh, it's closer than a brother, and this is love, he died so I could live, and he is good, and he is God, what I earn, it's not what I It's not what I find. What more could I say about him? My God is love. And I know my God is love. I know my God is love. This is enough to know my 
God is love. I know my God is love. I know my God is love. It's easy enough to know my God is love. I know my God. Please be seated. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are here today with all our hopes, our fears, our needs, just to see and to hear. We look to all our fellow worshipers to see your face this day. It's absolutely wonderful to be here and feel your presence with all that are here as well. It is with a great sigh and belief that we will not only hear but feel you in all that we do here today. Thank you for the gift of prayer. It is our belief this morning that we as a church would believe in prayer, not because it's a special power, but because you've brought us into a relationship with yourself and told us to pray and even given us an example of a prayer. Allow us the understanding that it's not the act of us praying that makes it so special in your sight. Rather, it's the object of the prayer that is so important. We don't pray to an object. We don't pray to the outside world. We don't plead and bargain for some little object. Rather, we turn to you, our Heavenly Father. You tell us that as, your, as our Father, you love to hear from us, your children. You tell us you love us in an act of our prayers and act through our prayers. So let us live, live as if prayer really matters. Let us worship as if prayer really matters. Let us not grow weary in this task simply because we've prayed before. Let us believe that often the best thing we can do is not to act first, rather it is to pray first. Let us give you praise and worship as we want to hear you speak to us through the words and music this day. And as we leave here, we pray to be shaped a little bit more like the likeness of your Son, Jesus Christ. For all of these and so much more, we know that we are truly blessed. And so we pause in silence to personally confess our sins to you now as we pray the prayer your Son gave us so long ago by praying together, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, but forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, as we uh, continue our service, I do want to let you know that there are ways to support the ministries of the church uh, that are uh, before you. Uh, there's going to be a slide on the screen for you that you can use uh, to support the church. If you just lift up your phone and scan that QR code, that is going to give you an opportunity to give to the church. And I'm always so excited to see how that our church changes lives. I ran into one of our church participants in the grocery store just the other day, and she was talking to me about what it means to her to watch the church and to be a part of things online. If she's not uh, able to come to worship physically, but it's meant a lot to her to watch something online, and she's not somebody that maybe technology-wise would have ever thought she would have enjoyed that, and it's changing her life. And it's lifting her up and building her up. And I'm thankful that we get to be a part of continuing to support people and really broadening our reach uh, into the community and around the world as we have higher views for our services every week and we have more and more people connecting with our congregation. That is good news. And your giving makes that possible. Thank you. You I would not waste your time thinking of ways to clear my name. Oh, at an hour, have mercy on me. If you're still listening to me, there's only one thing. I need now. Oh, at night, have mercy on me. Because I've got nothing to bring. nothing you I will not waste your time thinking of ways to clear my name oh at night have mercy on me at night have mercy on me at night have mercy
Amen. Y'all can take your seats. Aren't we blessed by wonderful musical leadership? What a joy that is for us. Um, this morning we're continuing our series on matters of life and death from James's letter to all of us. And um, we're in chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Before that I share the scripture, I want to do a little disclaimer. James is writing to the early church about wisdom from heaven that is useful when leading and influencing other people. And in this context, he talks about selfish ambition. And this is where my disclaimer comes in. You need to know that God does not hate all kinds of ambition. And as a matter of fact, God loves healthy ambition as motivation for what we say and what we do. Uh, healthy ambition is an inner drive to be our very best because we believe in what we're doing. We're passionate about it. That kind of ambition can better any organization. It can enrich the life of any team or group. Uh, when applied rightly, it can benefit and bless a family. It is okay to be competitive as long as we're not sabotaging the other people that we are competing against. It's okay to have a drive to excel. It's good to have a drive to excel. Ambition in itself is good when it is not selfish. When James is talking about selfish ambition, what he's talking about is a desire to get more public recognition and honors than we really earn in something that we're not really that passionate about. And um, I'm going to say that again. Selfish ambition is a desire to get more recognition and honors than we earn for doing something that we aren't really that passionate about. Uh, it's about promoting ourselves, and when selfish ambition takes over, we become glory hounds. Okay, that's what James is really talking about. And a wise person, what James is telling us is that a wise person that other people should listen to and should follow speaks and, and acts out of a good and godly kind of a wisdom and a good and godly kind of an ambition motivates that wisdom. So we'd all like to say that's who we are. Sometimes we don't recognize uh, the ways that selfishness motivates our speech and our actions. And uh, so James is talking to us today about how to recognize godly wisdom, how to recognize pure wisdom, which is based in a more godly ambition. And with that in mind, we're going to look at the scripture. This is James chapter 3, beginning with the 13th verse. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you, have, you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> when we think about selfish ambition, uh, we're probably thinking about specific things, maybe stories we've heard on the news. Maybe we think about uh, the reporters that have gotten in trouble over time because they fabricated a story or highly exaggerated a story or falsified a source so that they could get notoriety for their good reporting and the great stories that they have to report. Maybe we're thinking about somebody who sacrifices all of their family time for a job that they actually resent just so that they can get a certain title and so they can get that corner office. We like to think selfish ambition is far away from us and we like to think of these kind of extreme stories, extreme accounts that actually happen. But in reality, selfish ambition is right next to us, and it is within us. Think about these more personal, personal examples or more relatable examples for us. Maybe we know a pretty good person. It gets a promotion at work. Maybe we are a pretty good person who gets a promotion at work, you know? Uh, proud and celebrating and yet forgetting that we need to acknowledge the other people in our team 
that made it possible for us to get the recognition, to get the promotion, and uh, uh, not really intending consciously to do anything wrong, but yet not acknowledging the contributions of others and celebrating as if we did it all alone. How about a pretty good parent or grandparent, a well-intentioned person who uh, time after time, when given the opportunity to set some boundaries for their child that they're trying to mentor and to raise, um, just wants to be loved so badly that we give in to things we shouldn't give in to. We accommodate things we should not accommodate instead of focusing on building good character and good discipline for that child. It may not feel like selfish ambition, but it really is because it's focused on what we need in a relationship where our calling is to focus on what they need. And I think that happens to a lot of us, at least some of the time. Think about a big family event or a, an event for a group of friends comes up and there are people that pitch in to help and make everything happen. And there are people there that are there because they love the group that's gathered and because they love the purpose of the gathering and they want to celebrate and they want to be a part of it and they want to make it possible. And then once in a while we go and maybe we're having a time where we don't feel very good about ourselves. And the whole time we're helping, we're thinking, wonder who's going to thank me today. Wonder which one of my friends is going to acknowledge me. Wonder which one of my family is going to be sure that they notice how hard I'm working. And because of that self-centered attitude, we're not going to enjoy the event. We're not going to recognize how hard the people around us are working. And we're really not working for the right reasons. Sometimes we want acceptance more than we want to be helpful. And because of that, we may not end up being much of a help. All of those are examples of selfish ambition. And we could go on and on and on about the different ways that self and a desire to be recognized gets ahead of our priorities, our passions, our interests, and our care for others. It happens. And everybody I told you about might be deceiving other people, and that could be true. James talks about uh, being dishonest and, and hiding bitter envy and selfish ambition. But more than that, they are deceiving themselves. And James makes it clear that we have to have the right motivation to speak and to act in wise ways if we're going to be people that influence the world around us, which I think we all are. If we want to influence the world around us rightly, we have to have the right motivation so we can speak and act in wise ways. But how do we know our own motivation? How do we discover our hidden selfishness? How do we discover our hidden faults? And so let's look at James uh, verse, uh, th chapter 3, verse 17, and we're going to focus on our thinking about the qualities of wisdom. What does James say about wisdom? What are the qualities of wisdom? It says, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Now, wisdom from above, wisdom from heaven, is associated with some really wonderful traits that our society's emphasis on getting ahead uh, makes uh, us think are really bad traits or signs of weakness. Uh, we've been tricked into thinking of some wonderful traits as signs of weakness because we are so focused on getting ahead and selfish ambition is so excused and even glorified in our culture. So let's look at a few of these traits that are so important. First, wisdom from heaven is pure. Purity. Isn't that a childish thing? A lot of people think of purity as being uh, ignorance of the real world. Ignorance of life as it is. That we have kind of a magical thinking viewpoint and we're not really in touch with reality if we're pure that's that's kind of the way that uh, purity is represented in our world to the point that when there is a bookstore that sells inappropriate things or uh, pictures of scantily clad people what is it called an adult bookstore we think smut is mature but purity is not about immaturity purity is not about ignorance a, a better way to understand purity is to think of it as clarity uh, and the opposite of this kind of purity is really pollution. 
and particularly when it comes to our motives. If our motives are pure and focused on God, then we're going to find that the way we think about the world, about others and our place in it, uh, changes. So there is not a hidden agenda in godly wisdom. There's not a hidden agenda in godly wisdom. We can know that we're falling into some form of selfish ambition when our advice to someone else sounds like it's meant to help them, but really it's meant to help us. That is a polluted motive. That is a self-serving motive. When we do something that looks like we're trying to help other people, but actually it's more advantageous to us and we don't let them know that it helps us as well as them and act like we're some kind of hero, that is a polluted kind of a motive. That is an impure motive. And so um, it takes a lot of prayer to think about whether or not our motives are pure or impure. We should be asking God to reveal our own hearts to ourselves. We should be asking God, why do I do the things I do? You know, why did I volunteer for this? And why did I volunteer for that? And uh, why did I say this? And why did I say that? And would I have said the same thing with the same, uh, with the same opinion, the same viewpoint to a different person that might have been less impressed by what I'm talking about? That's what we have to think about when we think about our wisdom. Am I pure in my motives so that I'm the same person all the time, so that I'm not manipulating, so that I am clear in what I am about? That is wisdom from heaven that is pure, that is based in pure motivation. And so purity is not weak, and purity is not ignorant. Purity requires tremendous maturity and strength. And we should all be praying for God to help us have pure hearts. Uh, we should all be praying for that kind of purity in our motivations. It requires tremendous maturity and strength. Okay, the second thing, the second point we need to notice, uh, the word that just jumps out at me that is not a particularly popular word, is submissive. Wisdom from heaven is submissive. Well, that doesn't make any sense to us. We think of God as conquering. Uh, we think of God as coming in and bringing justice and righteousness and all these things. We think of God's power and his sovereignty, but our wisdom from heaven is supposed to be submissive. And it's everybody's wisdom from heaven. It's not that young people's wisdom from heaven is supposed to be submissive to older people. It's not that uh, uh, one less, uh, somebody less experienced with leadership, that their wisdom is supposed to be more submissive than somebody else. Men and women, our wisdom is to be submissive. And what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that we avoid saying things because of a fear of controversy. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that. Um, our motives are still pure. If our motives are to honor God, then we don't avoid things just for ourselves. We don't submit out of our own selfish interests to avoid something unpleasant. But wisdom from heaven is submissive because wisdom does not grandstand. Wisdom from heaven does not insult people who are in authority because wisdom from heaven would tell us that insulting people that have a position of authority over us is not going to further our cause and is not going to help them get closer to God. Wisdom from heaven being submissive feels foreign when we are grasping for control to let someone else who is called and genuinely qualified to take the lead. If we want control and somebody is called and genuinely qualified to take the lead, then we're going to buck against them. No matter how much we really believe that they're called, no matter how much we really believe that they're qualified to lead, we're going to buck against them. But wisdom from heaven that is focused with pure motives and pure desire to please God is willing to accept the leadership of other people. Sometimes we don't like the people who are leading us. You know, not me, of course. I'm your pastor. I know you guys all loved me, right? <laughs> but, you know, other people. I've heard of leaders that people didn't like. I, I don't know how that even happens kidding but uh but wisdom from heaven is submissive wisdom from heaven follows leaders that god has uh, led to lead and it doesn't grasp for power but it recognizes that there is a time to be mild-mannered and so it takes a big person 
to submit to the leadership of another. And in this community James is talking about, this early Christian community where everybody kind of wants to be a teacher because they want to be somebody, you can imagine they are all vying for the center stage all the time. But a wise person knows, a wise person knows that there are times when it is best to follow. A wise person knows that there are times when this is best. And so wisdom from heaven is submissive. The third thing I want to share with you today is that wisdom from heaven has lasting results. And this is the hope for us, beloved. It is not easy. It is not easy uh, to, to get rid of our selfish interests and focus on the good things of God. But wisdom from heaven has lasting results. And the fact of the matter is our own wisdom will just come to nothing. It will come to nothing. That grasping for control, that grasping for recognition, it just comes to nothing. Uh, we're taught in little and big ways that it is wise to exaggerate our accomplishments. And it starts young. I remember being a high school student and people teaching me how to write my college entrance papers in such a way that it would sound like I had done everything I'd done and maybe just a tiny bit more. And I don't know if they still do that or not. But that's the kind of thing that is exalted in our society. And it's good to put yourself forward with real, uh, real talents and real gifts and the hard work you put in. And we, sh we don't have to be falsely humble about things we've actually done. But we shouldn't be self-serving because it comes to nothing. The person that vies for the big promotion that they don't quite deserve and hides the contributions of the rest of their team, they're going to be bad at that job. And what's more, they're going to be miserable. They're going to be insecure the whole time they have that position because they're going to feel like they have to hide that they don't know what they don't know. And it happens all the time. The person who uh, just wants their child to love them. I mean, how human and relatable is that? Just wants their son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, even niece, nephew to love them. And they have an opportunity to set a good and godly example and to set some good boundaries. And it's just so hard because we just want them to love us. It's totally understandable. And yet at the same time, what a lifetime of regret can come from that regular practice, that regular form of mentoring a child. It's miserable to look back and wish you had done many things differently. The family events, the friend of, friendship events that we try to make about us when they're not about us, uh, you, you know, I, I think most people at some point have been a little bit envious of somebody else that it seems like was loved more, was more popular, life was going a little bit better at one of those kind of gatherings or in those kinds of friendships or family relationships. But the fact of the matter is any blessing we have in any relationship we have is going to be tarnished if we're always thinking about what somebody else has that we ought to have and how we're not getting the honor we deserve and how we're not getting the glory we deserve if we don't think about serving others and honoring God in those relationships, those relationships are useless. And honestly, eventually they're going to just dry up because it means we're not going to be very fun to be around. We're not contributing to a relationship when we're always thinking, what do I get out of this? That kind of worldly wisdom that is full of that envy and selfish ambition, it is miserable. And that's really... The point of our faith, isn't it? Uh, brothers and sisters, I have some good news to share with you that you're not going to hear a lot of places in the world today. And this is it. Jesus didn't actually die to make you miserable. He didn't die to make you miserable. He didn't put forward wisdom through his followers in this book so that you and I would have to work even harder at dotting our I's and crossing our T's and doing all the stuff he wants us to do. Jesus died to make us free, and he died to make us free from things that we have trouble not thinking are already freedom. We think we're free when we're protecting ourselves, when we're promoting ourselves, when we're trying to control everything, when we're trying to get ahead of everybody else. We are free when we put all of that down 
and focus on glorifying God with a pure heart, with pure motives, with humility. And joy and gratitude and life comes from that. And that kind of wise living and wise speaking and wise thinking, that is eternal. That lasts forever. And that's the opportunity for us. That's the choice for us. Do we want a life that's focused on ourselves? We're just dust waiting to happen. You know, our lives are this long in this world, and our lives are forever in eternity. And to try to claw to the top in this brief blip of time that we live in, it's meaningless, and it's miserable, and it ruins the life we have here. But we can die to our selfish ambition and develop a new ambition of glorifying God and lifting him high in everything we do with all of our talents and all of our abilities. And that kind of a life has eternal meaning. And it builds something that cannot be taken away, that is undefiled and stainless in the kingdom of heaven. None of us are perfect, and until we figure that out, we're not going to be able to confront this within ourselves. Not the people in James's day and not the people now. We, we have some stuff to work on. But God is faithful, and he has ambition for us of what he can do in our lives when we let him have control and let him get the glory and let whoever he raises up get the glory too. Because that is our high and holy calling, to glorify God. And it is a good life. Let us run toward that pure wisdom that comes from God. Amen. I just want to sit here at your feet and call a peace holy name. I want to sleep. Oh, I'm not here for fantasies. Jesus, you. Just one. I'm sorry. And I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry. I just sang another song. Take me back to where you start. I opened up my heart to you. Sing this next verse out. Oh, I'm sorry when I've come in my agenda. I'm sorry when I forgot that you've been known. Take me back to where we started. I opened up my heart to you.
nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just Sorry, and I've just gone through the motions. I'm sorry, and I just sang another song. Take me back to where we started. I opened up my heart to you. Beloved in Christ, go forth to love and serve God and your neighbor in all that you do. Let that be all that you do. And may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen.